Hello and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. Today we're going to talk about entrepreneurship. We're going to talk about how one entrepreneur and CEO has actually uh, done some really cool things in the community uh, stemming from his business and uh, what he does in his company even when they're, you know, when you got to pivot. Sometimes in business you got to pivot and actually Probably most times <laughs> there's always a pivot point and so we're gonna talk about that here today we're gonna have some fun we have Brandon Bruce with us he is the uh, founder and uh, co-founder excuse me of Cirrus Insight which uh, he grew from humble beginnings he actually comes from a tiny town in California with 800 people where he actually had one classmate at school going to uh, and they had an outhouse as their bathroom so humble beginnings now Having grown a company that does 12 million in revenue is number 41 on the uh, Inc. 500 list and um, just done some amazing, amazing things. And so we're excited to have him here on the Leaders of Transformation. Welcome, Brandon. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Excited to be with you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And also, I want to do a shout out to Jonathan Barshop, who had introduced me to Brandon. So thank you, Jonathan. I always appreciate the people that uh, refer me to amazing guests. And um, shout out to, uh, through Jonathan, BeMyGuest.fm is a company that, uh, one of the many companies that I get amazing guests from. And uh, so if you're looking to get on more podcasts, you might want to check out uh, BeMyGuest.fm. They actually help you get booked. And uh, there's many others, Interview Valet, Interview Connections. I don't want to leave anybody out, but I do. I always love uh, acknowledging the people that help support the Leaders of Transformation. And with that, I want to thank you for tuning in and listening today. Whether you're watching the video or you're listening to the audio, we just really appreciate you being here because you're the reason why we do this. We do this because we want to inspire you. My vision with this was always to, um, to help people to see themselves as leaders of transformation, that they can make a difference in their community. Brandon's going to share with us how he's done it in his community, taking something that they do all day, all day every day and say, hey, let's try this and go out and uh, collaborate with the schools and so forth. And so, um, and now is in the Guinness Book of World Records for doing it. So, you know, there's, but it doesn't have to be that. It can be something small. We can all make a difference in our local communities and, and want to encourage you to believe that it's possible and then look at it and saying, well, what can you do? How can you do that? With the skills, the experience, the connections that you have, what can you do to make a difference in the world? So uh, one other thing I want to uh, point out, and I'm really excited about it, is actually I'm finally going to be able to call myself an author. Um, <laughs> so I have a book actually I co-authored last year. Um, uh, somebody came to me who's been on my show, Dominic Damaski. He's a publisher, and he said, would you like to be part of this uh, collaboration? And uh, I accepted, uh, willingly accepted, because it was uh, about women's empowerment. And it is called Power Up Super Women. It comes out in February. And you can get a copy on leadersoftransformation.com. There's actually several of the guests who have been on this podcast are authors in that book. And so it's uh, stories of courage and empowerment, giving hope to women that they can be the difference maker, that they can create the, the life that they want through sharing stories of difficulty, disappointment, uh, struggle, and how they overcome it, uh, and so, or overcame it, good English. Um, and so uh, my chapter is on, it's actually called Worthiness Within, from within. So uh, anyway, go get a copy of that. You can get that at leadersoftransformation.com on the resource page. So Brandon, let's talk about, speaking of stories of overcoming, stories of encouragement, Tell us how you became an entrepreneur, where that all started for you, where you ignited that passion for, for business and, and so forth. So, yeah, I, I feel like a lot of it, uh, and I'm just making a note to download the book. Um, I feel like a lot of it started uh, for me, as for many of us, really early on. Uh, so the school that you mentioned that I went to for grade school, it's called the Family School. And it really was a group of parents that said, hey, we'd, we'd like to start a school. And so they got out the hammers and boards and built a school out in the mountains of rural Santa Barbara County, a little town called Los Olivos. So for folks that have uh, seen the movie Sideways, where a couple of buddies go wine tasting, uh, that's where I grew up. So uh, a lot of wineries, a lot of agriculture, 
uh, in the community. And it was a very small school. So like you mentioned, I had one classmate. And as a result, it was very self-directed. And I think that was important for me because if, if another student at school, for example, was learning algebra and I got curious about it, then I could just pick up the book and start learning algebra. There was no uh, set curriculum per se. We were encouraged to be uh, creative, learn the things that we were excited about, but also spend a lot of time outdoors. We did a lot of nature hikes and exploring around in the mountains. And so I think that was really perfect for me. Um, so that in combination with the fact that, that for me, you know, my parents were the first leaders that I was exposed to. So you, you as a kid, you kind of look up and watch what, what are they doing? Um, so my dad was the coach of all my sports teams growing up, soccer, basketball, baseball, et cetera. Uh, my mom was the director of the schools that I went to. Uh, so she was on the board or the executive director and helped to run a number of nonprofits. And so kind of watching them and seeing their involvement in all the activities that I was doing and cheering me on, uh, but also in the community at large, that they knew a lot of people, that they were respected in the community, that they could have influence, um, I think was an encouragement to me. So that when I was in college and I started to get kind of fascinated, this was mid, late 90s, by this dot-com boom. Like something's changing fundamentally. This sounds exciting. There's a bunch of people writing software and they're changing how stuff works. You know, Amazon pops up on the web where you can buy books. And now, of course, you can buy everything. Google pops up with the weirdest homepage anyone's ever seen because the only thing you can do on it is search. There's no way to contact them. There's no way to find out about them. You just search and it works. Um, so I started exploring those and really getting fascinated by stories of entrepreneurship, stories of investment, stories of transforming industries. And so thankfully, freshman year of college, I had a chance to meet Ryan Huff, who was my co-founder in, in Cirrus Insight, the business we, we ended up starting seven years ago. And so we built websites for companies and we were always brainstorming, what's the next big thing? What's a, what's a big idea? And we weren't able to get any of those really off the ground in a full-fledged startup. But fast forward, uh, you know, 15 years and we reconnected and he had gone to work for IBM and a bunch of other consulting companies and developed expertise on the Salesforce platform. And meanwhile, I was doing uh, basically frontline sales. Most of my experience has been in nonprofits. And so I was doing fundraising uh, for the college where my wife was a professor, uh, Maribel College here uh, in the, near Knoxville, Tennessee. And so we, we connected and he said, hey, what do you think about connecting the inbox? You're a salesperson. You spend a lot of time doing email. And I was like, yeah, all day. That's where my customers contact me and I try to solicit donations and keep in touch with them. He said, what do you think about connecting that with a customer relationship management platform like Salesforce so that you don't have to switch back and forth all day? And I was like, well, that saved me a lot of time. Right, the, the hassle for salespeople is we like to talk. Uh, we don't so much like to take notes about what we talked about. That seems like a waste of time. That's not helping me get the deal. Helping me get the deal is talking to my customers. So what Ryan started building uh, became Cirrus Insight. And my role essentially is kind of a quote unquote non-technical co-founder. I can build websites and do stuff like that. But Ryan's the true architect. Uh, is I spend a lot of time on the phone. So now I have a, a seven and a nine year old and you know, kind of when they were really little and they asked, well, what do you, what do, you do for work? I said, well, I talk on the phone for a living. Um, talk with a lot of partners, talk with a lot of potential customers and try to figure out what, what did they want uh, to see in this application so that when we launched in December of 2011, uh, we already had built up kind of a, a little small fan base of about a thousand people that were really excited about it and had told us, hey, if you build this, we'll use it. And many of them started to tell us, if, if you build it, not only will we use it, we would pay you for it if you want to charge for it. And so that got us over the hump to thinking, well, this will be a useful utility, but there's lots of free software on the internet, which is awesome. Uh, but when they started telling us we would pay for it, we said that there may be a business here. And so we started, we had paying customers on day one, and then it was really a goal of staying very closely in touch with our customers, finding out what they wanted and building it for them. That was kind of the original recipe, which is not which is not a unique recipe, although many of us start to stray from that, right? Like, oh, I have a neat idea. Let's go jump down that rabbit hole. Uh, but to the extent that we were able to stay very close to our customers, that's where our, uh, that's where our early success derived from. Well, I remember when we were talking um, in our pre-chat and you were sharing how uh, a lot of times people want to create something less and less now you'll realize that, you know, lean startup, this lean startup model is the way to go. But a lot of times, you know, in the past, it was like, I'm going to build something and I'm going to go like, ta-da, here it is. And everybody's going to, you know, run for it and so forth. And that doesn't actually happen that way. And so being in communication with your customer, there's, uh, there's a lot of wisdom in that. And, um, 
you maybe did it naturally, but just even asking and saying, if we build it, would you come? And would you pay for it? Which is really important. <laughs> yeah, those are the two big questions, right? Do you want this? And then how much do you want it, right? Like you know, yeah. the classic sales questions, you know, why, why you, why you now? Yeah. Like, yeah, that sounds good, but I'm not gonna pay for it now. I'm not gonna be, er I'm not an early adopter. I work for a big company. You're gonna have to get a bunch of them for me. Okay, we need to go talk to somebody else. Yeah. But yeah, I think uh, people vote I, with their money. <laughs> think, yeah, most of us are still tempted by the big, amazing surprise release, and I think it's because uh, one reason that I thought of uh, is because we've grown up in the world of of Steve Jobs and other really charismatic, brilliant founder entrepreneurs. That when they do a product release, it's amazing, and it's like, oh wow, that is brand new. You know, no one else really thought of that way of packaging a thousand songs in your pocket. I mean, there were a few others, but the way that Apple released it, right, all the pomp and circumstance. So all of us kind of want to have that on the stage experience of saying, you know, ta-da, behind the curtain, I've developed, you know, the iPhone or the iMac or some amazing new tech. Um, but for us, at least, and, and I, I would say for the majority of companies I'm aware of, it's not really how it works. I mean, if I do a grand release, no one particularly cares. There's no one watching like everyone was watching Steve and Apple. And so it's sort of avoiding the temptation to spring things on people, which can work out brilliantly if it is in fact that special. Um, but in many cases you, you release it and it's like, uh Oh, now I need to do the hard work of, you know, what I describe as go to market. You know, how do I tell people about this? And then how do I do the sales to actually get them in the door? Yeah. Um, and or tweak it. One. Yeah. Yeah. And or tweak it because it's not exactly what they wanted. Yeah. Right. I mean, how many Steve Jobs are out there? I mean, there's, you know, there's the potential for a lot of them, but yeah, I think there's a bit of arrogance too, um, which is like my thing. How many times have you, you know, heard an entrepreneur who said, you know, this is going to change the world. This is the thing. And um, making an assumption based on their own opinion that that's, you know, that that's the way it is rather than checking with the market and seeing does the market really want it? Will they pay for it? Do they want it now even? Is this the right time for it? I mean, you can be on, uh, I, have a, I have a coaching company called Discover the Edge. Um, you know, I, I joke about it and say, that, you know, there's, there's cutting edge and then there's bleeding edge and right. you, you don't want to be on the bleeding edge. It's painful to be on bleeding edge. So, you know, so that's, so in order to do that, you got to make sure you check in. So, so now with, um, serious insight, you've built it, you've got a team. Now at some point in time, you had a pivot point, which you had. Yeah. To make I mean, yeah, it's fair to say that. that as a largely bootstrap startup, Ryan and I ran it, the two of us, um, for the first nine months of the company and had a lot of kind of interesting experiences. So we kind of developed a lot of little startup aphorisms, like uh, never go to Disneyland if you're an early stage founder, because Ryan and I both took our families, because we both had little kids, uh, to Disneyland. And then of course, that's when uh, AWS had its famous 48 hour outage that took down Netflix and Instagram and a bunch of other companies, including us, right? So we're waiting in line for a little coaster to take our little ones on, and all of a sudden, the phone starts ringing you know, 30 times in 30 seconds. And, and the first thought was, wow, maybe we've really hit the market. But then reality sets in. And it's like, no, no, these are all customers calling because, you know, the app is down um, because of a power outage, I think it was at the time. And this was six years ago. Um, but thankfully, we were able to weather that. And one of the pieces of feedback that came back during that time period was, um, hey, your app's down. And I was like, cool, it's going to come back. We're just waiting for Amazon's power to come back. Everything will be fine. Salesforce is still up. Google is still up. So you kind of go back to the way you were doing business before you installed the app. Um, you know, nothing critical is down. And they said, no, you don't understand, we've changed the workflow. You know, the whole sales process now revolves around your app that sits inside Gmail. So we got people that kind of don't know how to continue to work. And I was like, well, uh, A, that's, that's really a bummer, I can see why you're upset. But B, in my mind, the right lights are going off saying like, oh wow, so for this company at least, we're kind of mission critical. That's a, that's a neat position to be in. It means we have a lot of responsibility, but it also means if we can be this way for lots of companies, we can be an instrumental app that really helps people. Salespeople save a lot of time and managers help to get, you know, good data into the CRM where they can actually make better decisions. Um, so we went through that period with lots of just up and down cash flow where one day or one week or one month, it felt like, man, we're lighting it up. Customers are rolling in, we're doing demos, we're selling, we're building features. 
And then the next day, the next week, the next month, it's like, was that it? Was that all the customers? You know, we, we hit a vein and then we strayed from the vein or we exhausted that, that line of go-to-market. And so I was trying to figure out how, how big can this be? Should we scale with this growth? Should we raise money? So we had what we thought that was going to be a strategic investor who had said on the phone, uh, we're going to come in and, and invest a half million dollars. We were super excited about it. And they said, if you hit your benchmarks, we'll come in with another million later. Awesome, right? This is, this is exciting. This is what we want. Uh, and then they got acquired the next day. And so there was no more investment activity by them. So we were kind of you know, crestfallen, except that an angel uh, came in and said, hey, you, you've written up the plan. I like the plan. I'll do it on the exact same terms if, you, if, you'll, if you're willing to. We said, great. So we raised some money about nine months in. So we're kind of a lightly funded uh, startup at that point. We ended up bringing on about a million and a quarter. And that helped us it kind of provided psychological permission as well as financial permission to hire the team. Because before that we thought cash flow is so rocky, right? We can go without a paycheck. We're the founders. We're taking the risk. We understand that implicitly. But we didn't feel like we could hire somebody and be like, Hey, it was a great February. You get paid. March was a little light. So you're not going to get paid that month. Um, that could be a little awkward um, at best. So having that money on board allowed us to scale the team. And then, yeah, fast forward to about a year and a half ago, you know, we've got 60, 70 employees on the team, half here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We go to market team, sales, marketing, operations, half in Irvine uh, with Ryan that are building the application, product development, engineering. Uh, and then, you know, we realized that Salesforce had a year or two before that acquired a company and then released an app that kind of competed with us. So here we have our, our main partner that now has a competitive app. So it becomes kind of a coopetition situation. Well, part of that was that we then uh, lost our listing on the Salesforce app exchange, which for those that aren't familiar with it, it's kind of like the iTunes store if you had a mobile app for Apple or the Play Store if you're on Google. So not having that listing meant that we weren't discoverable through that ecosystem. And we, we were the, the highest rated and most reviewed app of our kind. We had like 2,000 customer reviews. So in an Amazon world where people always want to look at reviews to see if what you're doing works and if you have good customer service and so forth, we made backups of all that, but it was no longer you know, publicly on the internet and this super reputable source. Uh, so that was hard. I mean, we had the third most reviews to DocuSign and Adobe Sign, and then it was Cirrus Insight. So it was a big go-to-market for us uh, and certainly backed up our reputation. So thankfully, having been five plus years in business, a lot of our sales at that point were based on word of mouth from existing customers. People knew about our brand, so they would come directly to us. Um, but nevertheless, we had to kind of retool our, our go-to-market and our investments to do more in the way of our own SEO, our own content, uh, whether it's blogging or podcasting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, versus relying on people to find us through that search. Um, so that was a bit of a pivot, not, not so much a product pivot. We wanted to keep doing what we were doing on the product. People liked it, but more in the sense of a go-to-market and, and channels. So I think more often than not, at least in the software business, people think of a pivot as, okay, we need to develop different software or our software needs to do something different or serve a different market. In our case, that, that wasn't really it. It was more of a, Hey, the, uh, you know, the river way that we've been transporting our goods is now temporarily closed where it's, it's closed for good. Perhaps uh, we need to load this stuff and take it over land or we need to take it by train. Right. It's, it's like a classic analogy to the old way of getting goods to market. How do we get our goods to market on the Internet where we lost some of our presence on the Internet? So that's been a big effort, you know, over the last year, year and a half to make sure we kind of shore that up and keep the leads coming in our way. Um, but that's, that's business. Things like that are going, having talked with a lot of entrepreneurs, almost everybody has gone through something like that, which feels, you know, kind of scary, but you just have to focus in and decide, okay, do we pivot resources? Do we pivot people? How do, how do we get our, our product out there? Yeah. And I think that, like I said in the beginning, I think that we all, yeah, all entrepreneurs at some point go to go through a pivot and entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Uh, I think that everybody's capable of being an entrepreneur, but I think it's conditioned out and we want, you know, there's certain people want security and so forth. And so the entrepreneurial space is not secure in many, uh, in many, many ways. Like there's no guarantees in life, but right. you know, I don't think there's guarantees in anything, quite frankly, even a job. It's like, you know, high risk and as, as far as I'm concerned. But when you're talking about here, I think is specifically a pivot 
which a lot of entrepreneurs are dealing with right now is okay so the way that the way that, and have been dealing with the last several years the way that i marketed my services the way that i did business is now changed because now everybody's on social media how do i do that or in this case like you talk about podcasting utilizing that people are going to podcasting my competitors are out there doing that and so they're getting more visibility than me how do i how do I reconcile that? And if and and how do you change if you have a whole team and a structure that is designed to go a certain to do it a certain way to now change it uh, and do it another way? Those are the those are the practices. Principles of business never change, but the practices will change as new things. And I think that's what the the that's what we're in right now. Is it's constantly changing and adapting as to how what what is our lead gen sources. And uh, that was certainly a big one for you, but it's also a good lesson is to not have, not that you just had one, but for, for anyone out there listening is don't just count on the one big, you know, the river, the flow, one right. flow, make sure you have multiple strategies because you don't want to, uh, you don't want to get stuck with a surprise that one gets closed off and then, then you've got, it just dwindles down to nothing. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the, and the challenges can be relying on uh, something like, like an algorithm, uh, relying on, you know, we've seen lots of businesses come and go because Google has changed its search algorithm where it's like yeah. they were winning one day and then this little change and they're almost erased off the internet yeah. through really no fault of their own. It's just changed. The world changed overnight. Yeah. Uh, and it happens for any sort of big player, whether it's Google or Amazon or Apple, it's some fundamental change. Uh, my app is no longer accepted on iTunes, let's say. Uh-oh, we've got a big problem. There's no way to get it on people's phones now in, a, in, a, in an efficient manner. Um, and so it's interesting to think through those channels just in terms of, is it all uh, mechanized? Am I paying for ads and, and it just runs, but we just do it at self-service, we don't know anybody. And, and to what extent can the channels be backed by a relationship? Which is to say, what our major... Uh, not fallback because we used it the entire time, but it's like, okay, if we don't have the listing, which is kind of mechanized and static and we posted our own stuff and then people wrote reviews for it. If we don't have that, what do we really rely on? And what we really relied on was just the relationships that we had developed because they're stronger than a page on the internet. So it was the partners that said, Oh, we've known, we've done business with you for six years. We're going to continue to refer our customers to you and our customers that have done business with us. Hey, yeah, as we transition companies and I become, you know, sales operations director, you know, and I usually stay at my company for two years till I've gotten that engine built. And then I go to another company and do the same thing. I'm going to take you with me as part of my toolkit every time. Uh, and then we've maintained a great relationship with Salesforce. Like we understand it's competition. Just like when they got into the marketing automation business, you don't see listings on the app exchange for Marketo and HubSpot either. Just happens. It's just the way of the world. But the relationships with whether it was their conference and events team, and we continued to sponsor events, their partner team, and largely the teams that work directly with customers. So their account executives, their customer success people still knew, okay, we have this product and it serves people in this way. But if we really need, you know, a customizable solution, if we need an enterprise grade solution for the, then we know we, we need to call on Cirrus because we want our customers to be happy. And so they would bring us in and, and invite us to executive meetings and, and say, yes, you, you know, we have this app, but we understood your requirements and it's not going to do it for you. You really need Sierra Insight. They've been doing it for a long time. They were the first to market that served, you know, Google and Salesforce users. So you need to talk to them. Um, so, yeah, it's one of those, uh, you know, trite but true sayings, you know, cultivate the relationship. I think just relying on the algorithm where, if their algorithm changes, who, who are you going to talk to? I mean, you can just sort of lodge a general complaint to the universe. Like, I, I wish people could find my stuff online. Um, whereas if you know people that say, I, I can vouch for you, you're good to do business with, then you know, that, that's really helped us a lot as a company, I think. Yeah, relationships are everything. I mean, when it comes right down to it, you do business with people. People do business with people when it comes right down to it. So great, great advice to never lose that relationship, never get so enamored by automation uh, and mechanisms that you lose the relationship with customers. And I think that's important. I think that's, a, that's why you know, I brought it out because nowadays everybody's talking about how can I automate my business? How can I just like make money while I sleep and I don't have to deal with it? Well, 
you know, it, it, you still want to have those relationships with people and those, those things don't change. Now you did something really cool. Uh, let's talk, let's shift gears and let's talk about that. L the largest computer coding lesson in the world. Uh, you're attributed to doing that. You brought in over 50 schools, 8,000 plus students participated. Uh, it's in the Guinness book of world records. Talk to us about when you did that, how do you, where did that idea come in the midst of building a business and being busy with all, you know, all the things that are required to grow and to be, to, you know, be sustainable. And, uh, and, and what have you done? Like, you know, what was the, what was the vision around it? And uh, just to tell us a little bit of backstory and, and, you know, where it went from there. Yeah. So I think uh, it's fair to say the first, let's say three, four years of building a company, we were pretty heads down. You know, we were in an unmarked office doing software work in an area with not a lot of software companies. Um, and so we kind of flew under the radar. And then starting about three years ago, I was like, it, it's time now. We have a team. Uh, I want to participate more in the community just as I had done previously and seen my parents and friends do. And so we just kind of made ourselves known and started showing up, right? That's a lot of life is just showing up. So, so I joined the board of the Knoxville Entrepreneur Center and Junior Achievement and the Muse, which is our local uh, children's science museum, and a number of other organizations. And then one of the coolest things that we did as a company is we started, we, uh, we've had a Friday company lunch for a long time. And what we decided to do was open it up to the community. So anybody that wanted to come, we would invite people specifically and they could bring friends as long as they told us we'd order the right amount of food. But there were days when we had 50 guests, uh, you know, join us for lunch and we just do family style and have a bunch of pizza or whatever it was. Our company favorites tended to be Cuban and Jamaican because uh, we got some great local places to do that. We'd have all these cool folks from the community join us and we just, you know, tell stories. And was some of it good for business development? Sure. Um, but was a lot of it just getting to know our neighbors and so that they could understand what, you know, what the heck is this software company doing? What are, what are you guys doing building sales software? And so it was fun just to introduce ourselves to the community. At one of those lunches, uh, one of the friends that I had made, uh, Caleb Fristow and I started talking about coding because he ran a, a local program that helps uh, largely middle schoolers and high schoolers uh, build apps and then they have an annual competition. So I said, that's awesome. You know, it'd be fun to get that out there more because Knoxville is one of the highest densities of PhDs in the country in large part because we have University of Tennessee and then right up the street in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which was known as the secret city is Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, which was created uh, in the forties for the Manhattan Project. So it's where uh, uranium was enriched uh, in the Manhattan Project and today maintains the United States nuclear arsenal. So all these super smart people, I mean, you can't jump on a plane to or from Knoxville without sitting next to a nuclear physicist, which is really cool. And so, and they have the fastest supercomputer in the world is located there. So I was like, we've got all the reasons to be known as a place that is great at technology and great at coding. How do we showcase that? And how do we start early, right? Because the stuff that we're exposed to as kids can be pretty transformative. And so, yeah, just kind of in the course of having lunch, I said, what if we broke the world record for, uh, you know, kids learning how to code? And we're like, well, what is the world record? Like, let's go find out and look it up. And then, you know, can we contact Guinness? Because they, they're famous for world records. So having their logo and their imprint would be meaningful. And so we went and pitched the school district. And, and I remember in the first meeting, at least, someone said, well, this is kind of a gimmick, isn't it? Um, and that sounded like kind of a loaded word, like is this, a, is this a gimmick that you guys are trying to do? But I kind of embraced it. I was like, yes, absolutely. This is marketing. You know, the effort is going to be transformational. The kids, I think, will have an amazing experience, and here's how. And so we recorded a YouTube video, and they all streamed it simultaneously in the classroom. Almost 10,000 kids uh, ended up participating in it throughout the community at 50 different schools, all the way from kindergarten to seniors in high school. And they all got a certificate at the end of the day that said, I helped to break a Guinness World Record today that they could show to mom and dad or caregiver at home, which was super cool. So Twitter was lighting up and all smiling faces. It was great. Um, but then also I said, yeah, but this is also going to shine a light and say, you know, the school district, the board, the PTA, all the teachers, all the volunteers that we care about this. We think it's important. We think that, you know, learning a, a technical language, if you will, it is important for this next generation. Just like learning a foreign language is a way to expand how your mind works. Learning whether it's coding or how to read architectural plans or how to look at an x-ray and understand what it is. 
it's just an important skill uh, for all of us to have. I mean, I'm so glad when I was, you know, 15 that I learned to build websites. I mean, HTML was pretty new. You know, Netscape had just released to create the World Wide Web in 95, um, you know, and had their IPO. And so that was a cool thing that I've kind of taken with me. And I'm not a professional coder, but it gives me some level of confidence that I can participate. And so we contacted Guinness, and that was, I've always told people, it was one of the coolest experiences I've had to do the effort that was successful. Um, but Sierra Insight was the vehicle that enabled it to happen. Because I was able to make the pitch, and we had successive meetings, and Knox County Schools was awesome, and they fully embraced it and brought a bunch of administrative resources behind it to kind of rally all the teachers and administrators. So it was an ideal, they were an ideal partner, uh, Teresa Nixon there especially. And then... But but it was nice to go into those meetings and say, well, isn't this going to cost? You know, are we going to have to coordinate all this and print a bunch of stuff? And then Guinness is going to charge us a lot of money and so forth. And so I was able to say, yeah, you don't you don't have to worry about any of that, right? So you're since I was going to pay for this. And so cost is off the table as an argument that we shouldn't do this. And that was a nice kind of baseline to start at. I'm like, okay, so if cost's off the table, all right, we're willing to put in some sweat equity and 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 do this thing. So. Yeah, net net. They have a cool uh, certificate up in their office. Says we broke world record. All the kids have their certs, um, and from time to time, it will show up on these national reports of like where do communities rank, where do states rank in their commitment to STEM education, or who's preparing their workforce for the future, or what are creative ways to engage you know students at an early age, and then it'll show up as a little citation like, well, Knoxville broke the world record and did this cool thing. So I'm glad it kind of helped to. Uh, put us on the map for that because I think it is important. Yeah. Well, and I remember when we were talking in our pre-chat that um, some people asked you, well, what are you going to do now? Like what's, what's next? And you're like, no, that was it. That was it. And I think there is a great lesson in that because sometimes we think that if we start something, I mean, this is the leaders of transformation. People want to make a difference in the world. And so you think that if you start something, you have to carry it through. And that's a big commitment. It's, it's like, it's like, a, oh, I'm, I'm making a lifetime commitment to doing this forever and ever. Amen. And it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, you did it. You have a great memory. The kids have a great experience. Everybody's, you know, it was, it was great all around. And then you move on and maybe you do something else. And, uh, you know, and so there's not this, this uh, heavy burden of it's got to have legs. It's great when it does, but it doesn't have to. If, you know, I'm just thinking about people listening out there who, you know, well, I could probably do it once or I could do something, but I don't know if I could do it forever. You yeah, no, I think I think I think that's exactly right. I think it's one of the things that oftentimes can stop a good project from otherwise going forward because people get bogged down in the early stage with, well, how will this be sustainable? Uh, does this need to be a nonprofit organization if it's serving other people? Because it doesn't look like it's going to make money, so it shouldn't be for us a nonprofit. And that's a lot of paperwork, and we should get you know. And I'm a, I'm an attorney. We should get a lawyer involved, drop the paperwork, and we're going to need to have an accountant. And all of a sudden, it's this huge thing that it wasn't meant to be. What it was meant to be is you know very much like a startup, very entrepreneurial. You know, Ryan and I did not start Sears Insight with a business plan. We only wrote one when a potential investor wanted to see one. We were already in business. We were already running fifty thousand dollars a month. We didn't have a, a business plan. It wasn't necessary to write it down. We just implicitly understood. We're writing an extension. We're selling it at a monthly cost, and people are going to buy it. If we get enough, then it will be a business. And if we don't get enough, we needn't have gone through the process of writing out a plan. It's not going to work. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a, it's a, it's overhyped to, to do, you know, kind of overplan things. I think things can be overplanned, or, or there can be a fascination with, uh, making things structural. Otherwise, well, if it doesn't have a structure, then it must be not worth doing or other people won't understand it. And so I'm a big proponent of kind of projects. It doesn't have to be an entity. It doesn't have to be legally incorporated. It can just be something that, that you want to get done. Uh, I took my son across the street from our house because there's a hill that I love to run up and down just to do training. Um, but I've been disappointed that people, for some reason, like to park their cars there, I guess, at night and, and you know, maybe have a 12 pack and then they just throw it in the woods. And so there's all sorts of trash. And so I took my son out there and we put on our gloves and I said, we're just going to pick up all this trash. And I told him, you know, when I was your age, I wanted to be a garbage man when I grew up. And he looked at me and said, uh, well, that didn't work out, did it? And I said, well, we're here now. We're picking up trash. So we, we stayed about out there about four hours and did about 15, 30 gallon bags of trash. 
and cleared it all out of the woods and we felt pretty good about it. But that's just a project. That was just a, you know, Saturday afternoon uh, with my son so we could spend time chatting and also just get something done in the community. But it wasn't under a nonprofit, wasn't related to anything. It wasn't part of a larger community effort. Uh, unfortunately, some people have already thrown some trash back in the woods, right? So it's gonna, we're gonna have to do it again someday. It wasn't something where it's like we prevented it going forward. Um, but I still feel like it was worth doing. Uh, and another example is we started this last year, uh, a group in Knoxville, and these are, these are nationwide. It was called uh, 100 Women Who Care of Knoxville. And there's 100 Women Who Care in lots of communities. And so I was looking at this going like, that's awesome. 100 women show up once a quarter. They each bring $100. They hear three pitches from nonprofits. They vote. And the nonprofit with the most votes walks out the door with $10,000. Uh, nice. It's not a nonprofit. It's not, it, it's just, here's the money. We like your pitch. Go do what you said you were going to do. And then they come back next quarter. And I was like, that's such a cool thing. It, 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 and there, there's no structure to it per se. You just show up and do it. And so we started 100 Men Who Care of Knoxville, just kind of as a group, tell you. And hopefully we'll do a joint event at some point, which would be super fun. But we, do, we did all last year. So we have four meetings and we're about to kick off for 2019. But I, but I also use it as an example of just simply like, hey, we, we want to support the community. Giving $100 is great. Getting the other with 99 of your friends and, you know, having a couple hours to hear about nonprofits you might not otherwise know about. And then bundling your money to make kind of a bigger instant impact uh, is really cool. And it need not be a foundation. You know, we didn't set up a foundation. We didn't set up any of that stuff. It's just a way to support the community. Uh, and so, so that's another one where I think it's, uh, it's underrated how much can be accomplished with, with, a, with a project. Just doing the project and then moving on. Oh, I love it. I uh, just, the light bulbs are going off and great ideas. I mean, that's brilliant. That's just so simple. And yet, it, what the, you know, the impact that it's making, that's just awesome. I, I love it. I love it. Like, You're I very like inspiring. Things, and, yeah, simple enough where I can understand them, right? Like if someone yeah. invited me, like, hey, just show up. Uh, you bring a hundred bucks, it goes to a, a, a good cause. Yeah. And, All right, I can do that. I, I don't well, you get buy-in. Yeah. yeah, you can get buy-in from people a whole lot easier than, okay, we're, 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 you know, we're launching this nonprofit. Again, there's that long-term commitment. What does that mean to me? Time-wise, money-wise, all that. And, uh, you know, and, and it, doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be that. And I think that's where also you mentioned about you and your son going and, and cleaning up garbage. It also doesn't have to be announced to everyone either. I mean, sometimes we think that, you know, it, it all needs to be promoted and, you know, you need the accolades. It's just, just do it. If you see it, you know, I, I heard once um, somebody that, that I uh, did some work with projects work or uh, with, and he said, you know what, if you see it, like you own it right? Like if you see something that needs to be done, just do it. I actually had somebody on my uh, Facebook page. We share a lot of stories of people that are doing really cool things. And there was this young woman who had come up with this idea for solar, um, a solar tents for homeless. Yeah. And somebody said, well, you know, we should get, we should get jobs for these people. Then they would, they wouldn't have to worry about that. And I said, that's a great idea and you can do it. Right. Like, you know, if you have that idea, this is this one woman's idea. What's your idea? Right. Just your your permission. It. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. No, no, no permission needed. Um, yeah. I per se, which I think is really powerful. But yeah. I mean, it's the classic uh, security aphorism. Right. If you see something, say something like, well, if you see the thing and you have an idea, go ahead. Um, no one's going to stop you. And in fact, a lot of people will likely join you if you have the initiative uh, to move forward with it. Because it's yeah. kind of, you know, it's, it's attractive to see someone out and it's like, oh, if they're going to do it all. And that's, that's how the 100 men group started is a friend and I, you know, it's useful to have another person that's in it with you decide to start to build this. Meanwhile, a couple of our other friends were doing the same thing on the other side of town. We didn't even know about it. So we, we then started to get ready to invite people. So we're like, hey, we're, we're going to send you an invite. And someone said, well, I already, I already filled out the form. And we said, we don't have a form. And he said, well, then someone else has got one. <laughs> and so we contacted them and joined together because there's no use having two 50 yeah. person groups. We're like, Oh, we'll just, you know, combine forces easy. And so again, the value of a project, cause we didn't have to combine boards. We didn't have to combine legal entities. It was just like, Hey, cool. You guys want to work together on this and see if we can get a hundred people to show up at the same place, same time. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, you know, it was a good, good back of the napkin project. Love it. 
Brandon, I absolutely love it. This has been great, very inspiring. And uh, yeah, there's lots of ideas flowing. And I hope that the people that are listening, that it's inspiring them, that they can do something in their community. Um, I also want to give them an opportunity to connect with you with regards to your app. Uh, and so they go to cirrusinsight.com. That's C I R R U S dot, uh, insight.com. And, uh, that, that's the best place to go. They can find, they can figure yeah, out. I mean, if you use Gmail, there's a, there's a free option there that'll help you track emails and schedule meetings by embedding your calendar. Can maybe route. explain a little bit more about what the app does. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's an extension for your inbox. So if you're in Gmail, whether you use, most, most people use Chrome, some use Firefox, just install the extension in your browser. And then you can do some cool things. Like you want to know if someone's receiving and opening your emails, we can track that. Uh, my favorite feature is being able to embed calendar times into an email uh, so that you could say, hey, are you available on one of the following times and someone clicks one of the times and it automatically books the meeting. Um, nice. When I first saw that, someone had sent me an email. I was like, that was brilliant. Like I booked the meeting. So they got what they wanted, which was a sales pitch to me. I got what I wanted, which is to sign up without going back and forth like 20 times in an email chain. Mm. And so I was like, oh, that was really slick. And so we ended up reaching out to that developer of, the, of that app and acquiring it and building it in uh, to Sears Insight because we liked it so much. So that one by itself is, is a big time saver. But there's a lot of kind of similar time-saving uh, features of the app, like email templates for emails that you're writing again and again. You might as well make a template out of it so that you can recycle it. Um, nice. So yeah, so if you're, if you're a Gmail user, and especially if you use Salesforce, we're kind of most famous for our integration with CRM. Um, you know, 150,000 people use it, so it's pretty well vetted, and people get a lot of value out of it. If you're in sales, it'll save you time. If you're in management, it'll get people to actually use Salesforce, which many of them are not going to jump at the chance to do. So it'll just kind of happen automatically in the background, which is a beautiful thing. Nice. Brandon. And yeah, thank it's a good point. Thank you for spelling it. Cause we had some funny, we had some funny things over the last couple of years where, cause it's Cirrus insight, not the easiest name to say it's Cirrus, like the high wispy cloud since it's cloud software that people have called us uh, uh, circus insight. That's one of our favorites because it makes it <laughs> like, like an analytics company for Barnum and Bailey or something. Um, serious insight, which is not bad because it's like, well, we're for serious salespeople. Uh, and then our all time favorite was someone called it citrus insight. So we thought, Oh, we're like a, we're like an orange juice futures company. And so <laughs> we made a video with an orange juice on it with, with our logo, which was pretty fun. Um, but yeah, serious insight, you can email me Brandon at serious com, or I'm on LinkedIn. So yeah, if anyone's listened and said, Oh, I want to get in on that Knoxville Friday lunch because I'm driving down 75 next week or, or driving across 40 to get the East Coast. Like, come stop by the office and we'd love to have you. Sounds great. Brandon, thank you so very much. Appreciate you being here today. You bet. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. And uh, for our listeners and our viewers out there, thank you for tuning in. And uh, I trust you got some inspiration, maybe some ideas, even some encouragement as an entrepreneur uh, that it's okay to need to pivot and uh, expect it expect it. it's going to happen in some some area of your business at some point just be open to it and uh and get around there's also great value in collaborating having a partner get around some people that you can talk through uh how that could look and uh, get feedback from your customers um a lot of really great insights here as well as of course even just doing a project do a project the community don't make it complicated don't get your, you know, your uh, design, you know, you don't have to set up an entity or nonprofit or anything. Just do it. Just do it. And if it works really well, then maybe down the road, you didn't decide to do that, but you'll know it already has success before you go and do that. So I encourage you that leaders of transformation take action. So I just, uh, I just hope that you take something that you learned here today and apply it because that's where transformation happens. Uh, we would love to hear your stories, love to hear how this has impacted you. Uh, if you have questions, certainly can you reach out to us, leadersoftransformation.com. You can also, uh, and we'll have all the links, of course, uh, in the show notes to um, Brandon's company, so you can reach out to him. And uh, find us also on Facebook. We're at, we're at Facebook at Leaders of Transformation. Twitter is Leaders Podcast. Instagram is Leaders of Transformation. 
And uh, as I said, we'd love to hear your stories, what you're doing to make a difference in your community. Because as we share these ideas, people get more ideas. And it's just this, this mastermind of, of, uh, of impact out there in, in the community. So we encourage you that. Look forward to hearing from you. And look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Leaders of Transformation real soon.